So I'm Bill Doley, the president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest, and it's uh, this is our seventh cafe in the 16th uh, uh, year of our Archaeology Cafe series. Um, it's great to have Sarah um, in for uh, Linda Pierce. Linda has a lot of activities around town that she's uh, involved in uh, and couldn't make it into for tonight, and so Sarah's taken over that that role. And we're here in Tucson, uh, where we, it's the, our home base, where we pursue our preservation archaeology mission. And we always like to acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Tawana Autumn and the Pascua Yaqui, and take a moment to reflect on whose lands you're on uh, this evening, uh, wherever you, you may be. This theme of collaboration between archaeologists and um, communities has been a really, I think, impactful one this year. And it's one that every time we are, you know, come together for one of these, it's always exciting. What new relationships will we find out about? How do how does um, one archaeologist deal with a community, and or how does the community interact with? Uh, this archaeologist that we're, or archaeologists sometimes that we're uh, speaking with each night. So I'm, uh, that idea of collaboration and its mutual benefits um, is a really important uh, theme that I think we've learned a great deal um, throughout this um, session here. And the other acknowledgement that we want to make is to the Smith Living Trust, they're supporters of this uh, cafe series. And so Jean and Eldon and Jay Smith, thank you for your support. And uh, we couldn't do this without you. So tonight, uh, Kisha Supernot will be, who is, um, she's the director of the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology and a professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Alberta. She'll be speaking to us on a very intriguing topic, archeologies that matter, heart-centered practice, indigenous knowledge and restorative justice in Canada. Kisha, thank you so much. And the screen is yours. Thank you. And thank you so much for, for having me. I'll just share my screen here. Tanse. Kisha Supernan Tsikatsun, a Miskwichi of Sky Gana Chinia, Otipimisiwak Nia. Good evening. I am Kisha Supernan, as introduced, uh, and I'm currently here in a Miskwichi of Sky Gana, which is the Cree name for the city known as Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, this is my ancestral homeland. Uh, I am Metis on my dad's side, so I'm a citizen of the Metis Nation of Alberta. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about what that means, because it really does inform my practice. Uh, and then on my mom's side, I'm British settler uh, and been in Canada for three and four generations. And I'm really happy to be here with you to speak as part of this, this great series. So thank you for the kind invitation uh, and to share with you a little bit about my work. And I'm going to talk today through some sort of more conceptual things. And then I'm going to talk about some specific case studies which sort of illustrate these concepts of heart-centered practice, Indigenous knowledge, and restorative justice, and how they intersect with, with my work. Um, just as a note that toward the end of my talk, I will be speaking about unmarked graves, and that can be a very difficult topic. So just wanting to let you know now, um, when I move into that, that section, there could be some things that, that are distressing. Uh, and so make sure you take care of yourself in, in the way that you're needed. So I... Um, uh, yeah, I should have moved this when I was introducing myself. Yeah, so this is a little bit about me. This is me excavating at a Métis archaeological site in southwestern Saskatchewan, about uh, 60 miles north of the Montana border. Uh, and I've been working closely with Indigenous communities throughout the majority of my archaeological career, which is now over 20 years, amazing to say, and uh, increasingly moving toward community-driven archaeological projects, which I will also talk about today. Uh, and I took over as director of what we call the IPIA, the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology in 2019, and as part of that work have been expanding um, my work in collaboration with communities, primarily in Western Canada. So the areas I tend to work are in the Western half of the lands we call Canada. So 
what kind of frames my work is reflecting on what archaeology is and kind of who it's for. And I do this in a way that reflects upon my own training. How was I taught uh, to be an archaeologist? What was I taught were the, the core elements of, of becoming an, an archaeologist as a, as a young uh, student? And I was very much taught in the model of archaeology is the scientific study of the materials of the past for the good of everyone. And that kind of we do it for all of humanity uh, was embedded in my training. And the questions that I have reflected upon since that initial training have been, well, what gave non-Indigenous archaeologists, for example, the right to tell the stories and do analysis of Indigenous places? And this is tied up with this question of what has archaeology been and then what it might need to, to become. So when we're reflecting on what archaeology has been, and it's been very much extractive, and it is both literally extractive in terms of we dig things out of the earth, we do it carefully, we record, you know, we, we take care in that work, but it still is a form of extraction. And then the knowledge that is generated through what we take out of the earth also then can be a form of extraction because it's taking knowledge, uh, taking history uh, away from the people whose ancestors left that record in, in many cases. And that's in part because archaeology was very much tied to colonialism and tied to the idea that certainly in North America, that Indigenous peoples were going to either disappear or just be completely assimilated into uh, society and therefore there wouldn't be a descendant community, there wouldn't be those ways of knowing in these lands. So this sort of colonial approach uh, and also tied up with um, sort of empiricism, the focus on objective knowledge, the focus on very Western frameworks of what knowledge is and should be, how do we know, what are the ways in which we know about the past, very much grounded in that, and, and also grounded in a tradition of sort of free inquiry, which is that people have the right to study whatever they want. And I think we're coming to a point where we're asking questions about the ethics of that. And it's not to say that people don't have the right to study, it's more so where does that emerge from and what does that actually mean when there's people saying, hey, maybe we don't want you to be studying what you're studying uh, because it's, it's not, um, it's taking away uh, our own sort of sovereign rights to tell our own stories, for example, for Indigenous people. And then we also know from a lot of recent work, especially, but that archaeology remains um, a place where there is not a lot of diversity. And this is both true in sort of representation, the people who practice archaeology, but it's also true in the stories that we tell as archaeologists, because fundamentally that is what we're doing. Whether we're using scientific methods or using other forms, we are generating narratives about the things that happened in, in the past. And when we only have certain people sharing those narratives, then I think we actually lose something in our in a more fulsome understanding of the past. So when we think about what archaeology has been, what I want to talk a little bit about is what I would like archaeology to become. And I think we're already on this path. It's more so how do we continue to move in this way? And I like to think about archaeology's role in what I call restorative justice. And I'm certainly not the only archaeologist or the only scholar to use this. Uh, but I do want to articulate what I mean when I say restorative justice, because if archaeology has been extractive, then how can archaeology be restorative? How can we sort of seek to address that history, uh, both in terms of the discipline, so how do we address that within the discipline, but how do we use archaeology to seek redress for descendant and ancestral communities, other marginalized peoples? How do we use the tools and techniques which are powerful yeah, archaeology can know and, and illuminate a lot about the past. How do we do that to serve community needs and to lead toward calls for justice? Uh, and this will become apparent, especially when I talk about the work that I do around unmarked graves, because that really is fundamentally about justice. But it doesn't have to be as explicit as that. We can be working in those ways uh, that also can support that restorative nature that archaeology can become. Then it's also expansive, right? This idea that I mean, we've seen this over the past 30 years of like multifocality and trying to create more space for, for, for what uh, we consider to be part of the archaeological narrative. And I think there's more we can even do at that time. And particularly in terms of recognizing that, th that 
science isn't the only real way to know that every knowledge system has its own way to know. And I'll talk about that a bit more uh, on the next slide. And then also one that undoes histories of harm and extraction. And in this, I really think about things like repatriation, rematriation, return. So when belongings and ancestors need to go back to community that they are going back in, in culturally appropriate ways, and also in terms of data, what do we do with the data that's generated through archaeology? How is that, um, who owns that? And, and where does that information end up and who should? So those are some of the questions that emerge out of that undoing the, those histories that have created uh, often harm and, and supported those extractive practices. Another component to how we sort of take the concepts of archaeology's restorative justice and actually embed them into our practice is heart-centered archaeology. So in 2020, um, I co-edited this uh, volume, which was such a joy to work on, um, called Archaeologies of the Heart. Uh, and we were able to create a space for many different scholars from many different places and many different backgrounds to come together and imagine what heart-centered practice might look like. And in the introduction, Natasha Lyons and I outlined sort of four chambers of the heart of heart-centered archaeology. And these four chambers are care, emotion, relation, and rigor. Now, I'm just going to briefly give you a sense of what these are, and you can read in more detail in, in the introduction. But care is really sort of multifaceted in that we mean both care for the belongings of the ancestors and the places that archaeological materials um, are in the ground, as well as caring for each other as humans, because we know that archaeology is not always a safe space. So this chamber of care is also very fundamentally about how we recognize that we are all whole people, and that when we bring our heart and we bring ourselves to the practice of archaeology. Um, we, we need a safe space to do that. And But when we are given that safe space, so much more richness can emerge from that. And then if we're going to support that diversity of voices, that we need to have that ethic of care through principles of community and how we come together. Uh, and, and doing that in a way that also recognizes power dynamics and boundaries and, and upholds them. And the second chamber is emotion, and a, the second half of the, the volume in particular invites archaeologists to explore how we understand emotion in the past, in the material record of the past, because I certainly was taught in a, in a way that was very much not making space for emotion as a valid part of doing archaeology. Uh, in terms of the, the interpretation and analysis of the materials of the past. But we are all emotional beings. And many of us have close emotional attachments or connections to the places that we work, to the materials that we work with. You know, we are connected to them through often various emotions. And I think many of us have probably also had emotional responses to particular parts of the archaeological record in different kinds of ways. I know that's certainly been my experience of certain items or certain places have particular emotional resonance, uh, and we can feel that. And the emotion chamber also recognizes that people in the past were also emotional. And well, we can't say that the way I feel about something is the way that someone, you know, 3000 years felt about something, we can recognize that they felt something. And we can also recognize that people make decisions for emotional reasons, as well as for other reasons. And, you know, so this is sort of this idea that people choose to do various things in their lives from a state of emotion, not just from a state of, you know, biological fitness or economics, that there is this other layer that sometimes is, has a clear material record if you know how to look for it, but that also we need to advance methods to really understand this, this aspect of the, the material past. The third chamber is closely connected to Indigenous archaeologies, and it's really about being a good relation and building strong, healthy relationships within the discipline, with each other as practitioners, with descendant and ancestral communities, but also an expansive understanding of relation beyond human. And because many other knowledge systems in the world connect with animals, plants, land, water as relation, and in you know in a way that is a kinship relationship and, and has certain sort of responsibilities. So it is really about that a lot of this knowledge flows from relation. And that's a very important part of, of understanding. And then the fourth chamber is rigor. 
Um, one of the reasons that we included rigor is because there is a tendency, like when I say heart-centered practice, I think there is a tendency to think, well, where's the rigor? And that there has to be this sort of scientific rigor involved in, in all of the work that we do. And I think we, in this introductory chapter, we draw upon sort of philosophy and say, all systems of knowledge have some form of internal rigor. It is not as if anything goes outside of science. We can just make stuff up. In an indigenous knowledge system, there are specific protocols about what knowledge is, who holds it, who learns it, who gets to pass it on. Uh, and those things all have their own internal systems. And rigor is not only found in, in, sort of in science. Uh, and so, and, and also this reflects the need that when we are doing work that is centered in care, we also need to attend to the specific methods that we're using. We don't want to um, overstate, for example, what we can know with archaeology uh, when I'm doing work, again, around unmarked graves. I don't want to tell a community that I found something that I haven't. So being very careful and deliberate about the use of these scientific techniques and what they can and cannot do is also a part of rigorous practice. So this is sort of the the chambers of a heart-centered practice and they really inform how I do archaeology with my students, with my community partners, uh, and how I would love to see archaeology continue to move. And one of the other things I'll just note about archaeology of the heart is we really wanted it to be an invitation because there are many archaeologies. We've got indigenous archaeologies, feminist archaeologies, anarchist archaeologies, etc. But heart-centered archaeology is anyone who has a heart and is an archaeologist can practice this. So even if you, you know, indigenous archaeologies may not be appropriate to apply to Neanderthal sites in Europe, heart-centered practice is. And so it's sort of a, a, an opening and an invitation to imagine doing this, this work um, in every place and in every time. So when I'm thinking about heart-centered archaeology and thinking about restorative justice, uh, my work is increasingly moving to, you know, from sort of a more collaborative model, which is something I used or tried to use in my, my dissertation work, to community-driven archaeology. And what do I mean by this? Well, it starts with the community being the origin of where are the areas of interest. So communities may want to know certain things that archaeologists can help figure out. Uh, and there obviously has to be conversation with archaeologists in this process, but it's not the model of an archaeologist comes up with a research project and goes and finds a community to work with. This is coming from the community to the archaeologist. And then the role of the archaeologist is to figure out, okay, this is the interest you have. How can we develop a project which, well, could we develop a project that could answer those questions with archaeology? Is that something we can do? Um, and if it is, then how do we develop that together? How do we figure out the frameworks that we want to work in, the protocols that we want to use in the field? Are there ceremonies? Are there other considerations around the work? Uh, and then it's very much wrapped in that community focus. Uh, and then also there's clear agreements about what happens with the information afterwards. Who shares it? How is it published? How is it stored and curated? How are the materials of the past cared for over the long term? And that the onus of that comes from community and archaeologists sort of facilitate and, and shape that uh, based around their knowledge and experience. Um, and so this is very much the the model of work that we promote at the Institute of Prairie Indigenous, Prairie Indigenous Archaeology because we want uh, our work to address interests that the community identifies. Um, of course, there are limits to that because if a community comes and asks me to do something that is far beyond my specific expertise in archeology, span uh, I see it as my job to connect them potentially with other archeologists who could help, not to necessarily do all things for, for all communities, but to, it's the inception of research piece. It's where that kind of comes from and uh, centering that in, in the community. And when I'm talking about frameworks, so the uh, on the last side I was talking about de deciding upon those different frameworks, what I really think about a lot is the systems by which we generate knowledge uh, and the ways in which we take the materials of the past and create structure to make sense of them. Again, most archaeologists are trained to use various scientific methods and approaches, uh, which can have their own value, but they are very much focused around categorizing, creating taxonomy, 
typology, uh, hierarchy in time. I mean, even something like a Harris matrix is a certain sort of hierarchical structure. Um, thinking about artifacts as objects to study and that there's a, and that strong sense of sort of objectification of materials. Um, separation, so dividing things up based on uh, categories that we determine to be significant, such as, you know, stone versus bone. And these uh, are then separated into two different analytical ca categories. Let's look at all the bone tools and let's look at all the stone tools um, and do analysis on those. So everything's sort of put in boxes. And then those boxes are units of analysis. We run statistics, we look at patterns, but those all based on the separations. And then we literally put them in boxes, those materials. And they're curated in particular ways that are often in, involved, you know, boxes in warehouses and in museums and institutions where these materials end up. So it's all about sort of the separation, you know, little bags and tags and everything like that. Now, from an Indigenous perspective, and there are many Indigenous perspectives, but what I do know from the work that I've done and from my lived experience is that there are things that we share. Uh, and these may express themselves differently in different places, but they are commonly found in Indigenous knowledge systems and frameworks. And it's about the connections, not, so it's not about the boxes. It's actually about the threads between those webs, those things that are related and also very much situated in place. Indigenous knowledge systems are grounded in specific places. And so the framework emerges from those places, the very situated and interwoven. and they're not objectified, they are lived. They are part of sort of shared and lived experience. So when we're thinking about developing projects and working with communities, there's a very two very different knowledge systems at work. And there are times in which they're at odds and there's times in which they can connect. But I'm also really interested in how do we actually create an archeology span that centers indigenous frameworks when we're working in places related to those communities. Now that is not something that non-indigenous archeologists should be doing uh, on their own. They need to work closely with communities and knowledge keepers and elders. Um, but as someone who's a member of an indigenous community, I do that within my own work. So when I'm working with my ancestors, I can bring forth that sense of um, th that kind of framework. So what does that actually look like? Well, uh, there's two things I'm going to talk to you about in terms of case studies and sort of all of the things that I've just shared with you and how do they actually play out in the archaeological work that I do. The first one I'm going to share with you is a project that I work on with my own ancestors and my own family, my own community. And this is the Exploring Métis Identity Through Archaeology or Amita project. This I've been working on now for a little over 10 years. Um, I started by just going to the community and being like, hey, I'm an archeologist. Is there anything you'd like me to do that would be interesting? And uh, the, the response was, yes, let's just do some archeology span because it really hasn't been done before. And it can help us show where we are in the, the homeland. And I'll talk a little bit about what that looks like in a minute. And so the research questions were chosen uh, in a way that reflected the interests of the, the community. And, they're also very much connected to my own history and my own family and uh, connecting to what that meant because I was, my dad was raised in foster care and I was raised quite disconnected and I spent my entire adult life coming home and, and meeting my relatives and reintegrating into my family. Uh, and this reintegration through this process has allowed me to imagine what a Métis approach to archaeology might look like. So not just archaeology on Métis sites, but a Métis-centered archaeology. Before I get into all that, though, I'd like you to know a little bit about who we are, because we are a one of three recognized Indigenous communities in Canada, alongside First Nations and Inuit. Uh, there are Métis in, historically in the United States as well, but they're not recognized. Uh, our homeland is primarily in the center of Canada, sort of just to the uh, west of the Great Lakes, all the way to the, the Rocky Mountains, and uh, all the way up to the Northwest Territories and down to the Dakotas. And this was our traditional homeland. Um, we emerged out of the early fur trade days, where French and uh, other European fur traders um, had country marriages with Indigenous women and had children. But we have tended to be misunderstood as only being of quote-unquote mixed blood. And my father's 
birth certificate says half breed. That's a very common term that was used for us. And it was very much focused on having mixed heritage. But every, not everyone who has Indigenous and non-Indigenous heritage is Métis. There are plenty of folks who are full status, who have non-Indigenous ancestry and Indigenous ancestry. We are Métis because the children of those initial unions married children from very similar unions in that same sphere. And that happened in my family for like five generations, four generations, where they married other Métis people and created these interwoven webs of kinship and way of life, language, dance, uh, cultural symbols. And we were a recognized people uh, by the early 19th century. And in actually 1816, first flag raised um, and called the new nation. Uh, and so we had a sense of na nationhood even in you know, 1816. What happened is that in uh, 1867 with the Dominion of Canada, the Métis, uh, our ancestors did not recognize Canada's dominion over them. And so they resisted the imposition of that dominion and negotiated a, a settlement agreement that created the province of Manitoba. And then Canada didn't, didn't uphold its side of the bargain. So we had a second resistance in 1885 where we were resoundingly defeated. And Louis Riel, who was the main leader, he's the man in the center of the photo here, uh, was hung as a traitor. After that, we underwent a long history of dispossession. So we don't have reserves, we don't fall under any kind of legislation, we don't have the same kind of benefits as our First Nation and Inuit uh, relatives. Uh, so when I came to trying to do a Métis archaeology, I was like, okay, well, we know there should be an archaeological record because we were around, and even the early fur trading sites were our ancestors who were making those. Even if they weren't at the time fully understood as Métis, they were still our ancestors. And uh, when I went to look at what had been done before, what I found wasn't very much. There had been some work done in the 70s and 80s in kind of a sort of salvage model. And the emphasis had actually been on our mixedness. So it was all about sort of looking for creolization and hybridity in our material culture and spatial patterning, making arguments about how Métis women wanted to be more like their European cousins, and that's why they use certain types of material culture, uh, and then also a dismissal of the, the use of stone tools or the creation of stone tools by Métis communities. And for me, when I was reading this, I was like, well, this is, this is not a Métis archaeology. This is sort of applying these outside frameworks to an understanding of, you know, this mixedness, which is, again, not our, our, it is a part of our history, but it's not our defining characteristic. It's not all we are. And, you know, there are, there's much more nuance and complexity than just, let's look for things that are mixed. And at the same time, as I was doing this, I was learning about my family. And what it was really interesting is that most of that work that had been done in the 1970s and 1980s was focusing on the second half of the 19th century, especially the period from about 1850 to 1880. Uh, and this is the time in which many of my relatives that I was discovering were born and were living. So what you have here are two things. The document is part of what was called Métis script, which is a tool of our dispossession. It was designed to deal with our land, the land problem of the Métis by giving us either land or money. Uh, and so this is my um, three times great grandmother who was actually born as part of a First Nation, married a Métis man and took Métis script in order to feed her family. And then her son is in the photo. That's Alexis Supernon. He's my great-great-grandfather. He was born here in Alberta, uh, as was my great-great-grandmother, um, Marie Fleur Gauthier, who was actually born only about you know, 30 miles from, from Edmonton. And I was learning about them. And I really wanted to reclaim our stories. I wanted to go from that, oh, let's look at our mixed material culture, to saying, what were our families doing? Where were they? What was their way of life? And so this is partly what inspired me to develop a Métis approach to archaeology, which is based on a lot of Métis scholarship, which talks about something called kinscapes, which is the connection between kinship relations, both between humans and with other than humans across the land. And so this idea of this constellation or web of relations situated in, in place and landscape. And for me, I drew upon some of that scholarship and expanded it a little bit using the metaphor of the Métis sash. So the Métis sash is a very important uh, symbol of our community today and was extensively in use in the past as well. Long hand-woven sashes. So the threads were uh, 
braided and woven together, and then they were used for a multitude of purposes. And what is important about this is that when I talk about this metaphor, I do draw and sort of talk about what those threads are. And there's five threads. So there's Métis mobility. We are highly mobile across that landscape. We have accounts of people moving, you know, six, 700 miles in a season uh, every year for years and years. And they're so hugely mobile where our families, the land itself, the kind of geography and, and the, the places that we were connected to, the rhythm of daily life, right, which archaeology is often very good at, at uncovering, uh, and then our economic role in the fur trade and, and other kinds of economic activity. But the dominant thread is, is red and its relation. And this idea is that you can't actually study any individual thread. They only actually make sense when you weave them all together. So when I'm doing archaeology on Métis sites, I'm thinking about all of these interwoven. Some of them track more clearly onto particular types of materiality, but ultimately they all have to be considered as part of an understanding of Métis history through archaeology. Now I could talk a lot more about you know, how that plays out in different elements of my work, but I want to come to one piece of it. And this is Métis beadwork. And I think it illustrates aspects of all of those threads really, really well, and also tells you a little bit about why this approach is so meaningful and resonant for me. And I want to talk to you about beads. So Métis were known for elaborate floral beadwork using primarily drawn glass seed beads imported through Hudson's Bay trading networks into what we now call Canada. Uh, to the point that Métis people were known in some Indigenous languages as the flower beadwork people. They were woven by Métis women uh, and worn, uh, beaded by Métis women and worn by Métis men. So Métis women's dress was actually quite somber. Métis men's dress was very flamboyant. And you hear this accounts from these, these Europeans who were like all these floridly dressed Métis men. Um, and so this is a relation, right? You've got a gender relation here between the beadwork made by women for primarily men to wear. Uh, you also show the, the mobility because Métis would be moving around to acquire these beads. Men would be going to the trading posts and getting certain types of beads for, for their partners and bringing them back to the various settlements. Um, you see them connected to particular places. They, beads gather in places where Métis gather. Uh, and then the daily life, especially in the winter, was one where uh, women were doing a lot of beading. And so we see the remnants of that in the archaeological record when we design our methods to, to look for them. And then many Métis women also made these as part of an economic transaction. So they actually made them for sale and for trade. So beads themselves have all of those threads in the sash. And like I said, when we're looking for them, we find them in the archaeological record. Most of the time, we find them as individual beads. So we're working in a Métis cabin site, which was lived in in the winter, and we'll find remnants of those beads kind of scattered throughout various parts of the cabin. You should probably dropped in the process of beading. If anyone's ever tried to bead, you always sort of drop beads. And in the dirt floor of a cabin in the dark of the winter, you're not likely to find it again. But sometimes we find more. And this particular piece was found by one of my graduate students, Eric Tebby, and he had uncovered a pattern. Now, this was at a site where we were pretty sure we were in a Métis cabin. This is basically the smoking gun, because this pattern is distinctly Métis. And we see very similar colors of beads and patterns being used in other beadwork from the same era. So this site was in the 1870s. And the um, image of the, the piece uh, that you have there that's beaded is also from the 1870s. So you see a clear connection between this piece was a flower bud. Uh, so it was one of probably connected to a larger piece of some kind, but it was protected in the ground. Uh, there's a big metal piece over top of it that seems to have sort of spared it from a lot of the ravages um, of the weather and, and gophers and other things. And therefore, we were able to uncover it and we were able to remove it from the earth and keep it intact. But this piece also did something else. And this is where that concept of relations expands beyond how we're looking at the past and how it, looking rather at how it connects to the present. When I was doing the work to conserve this piece, to uh, solidify the, the soil and make sure that we could maintain the pattern, 
I started having a very strong sense that the beadwork was unhappy. And that had me reflecting a lot as I was continuing my own journey as a Métis person coming back to my ways. And I had been uh, hearing a lot and learning a lot about this concept, which is called Wakotuin. So Wakotuin is a Cree word, and certainly in my family and many Métis, Métis families, our closest familial connections are to Cree communities. And this is uh, how Wakotuin is described by one of our most well-known and beloved elders, Maria Campbell. And she really talks about Wakotuin is not just about relation, it is, but it's about the honoring and respecting of relation. So it's a concept, but it's also a practice. So to be a good relation is a practice of a form. And that, and that being a good relation is reciprocal. So we have responsibilities as relations to treat our relations with care. So what did this mean for me? I learned from this beadwork piece that it was a relation. This is not an object that I study. This is part of my relational web, part of my kinscape. And I have then responsibilities to care for this relation according to Wakotuan. And that means for me, not putting it in a warehouse. It means for me having it sit with medicines in my office, having it come when my Métis relatives come to have tea with me, bringing it out so we can all visit with this relative, to have it as an active part of my ongoing relations. And this is again where those frameworks come into play because I'm required to send this to a museum in Canada. That is actually the law. And I'm trying to say, well, is that the right place for it? And who decides? So that's sort of how this operates in the, the Métis side of my work. And I'm now just going to briefly talk a little bit about the other aspect of my work, which is how do I use the techniques of archeological prospection to support indigenous communities to search for unmarked graves. Now, many of you will have been learning more about this from the news uh, over the last two years. I will be talking broadly about residential school work a little bit later on. I will not be talking specifically about any given project because that would be inappropriate. Uh, however, I will be showing you a, a project that's related where we were searching for a burial ground using very similar methods and techniques that we use in residential school contexts. And this one, uh, I have an enthusiastic support to share. So just wanted to make that, that very clear. Before I get into the details, I just wanna share with you the sort of principles that we try to bring to any work, but especially work around unmarked graves, that we start from the place that we know this is emotional, whether it is a residential school child, whether it is a historic cemetery, there is an emotional component when you are searching for the relatives who are gone. So therefore, all of this work has to be community-led and community-driven. I never do a burial ground project unless explicitly approached by a community to do so. I would never go out and propose this to a community. Uh, they determine the ceremonies that are necessary and ceremony must be part of this work because otherwise the work has a lot of potential to do ongoing harm. Um, we learn a lot from community when we're doing this work. So where we go and search is directed by a few things, but we certainly strongly consider what survivors and community members tell us. So when they say, we want you to search over here, we go and search over there. We try to make sense of whether or not the techniques are appropriate for that area with the knowledge that we can look at as archeologists, but we always do our best to search those areas to provide results quickly um, so that we're respecting those needs of like wanting to have knowledge about what uh, this, these techniques can bring. And then we recognize indigenous data sovereignty. And it is a little bit easier in this work than it is in archeological work more broadly, where we really can say everything that we gather is yours. It's not mine as a researcher. It is not the universities. It is not the government's. It is yours to decide what to do with. And so that's a core component of it as well. So just uh, as a quick example, I worked with the Puppets Chase First Nation. So I showed you that script record from my three times great grandmother. She was Papa's Chase. She was part of this community. And we were dispossessed. Uh, originally, we had a, um, a surveyed reservation in the southern part of what is now the city of Edmonton. But the history of dispossession uh, had also had a lot of erasure of important places. And there had long been knowledge in the community of there being a potential burial ground near Cascateo Aski or Black Mud Creek, which is in the southern part of the city. 
So this is just a, a couple of images to show you. So the uh, one is the plan for the band of Chief Papa's Chase. This was supposed to be the reserve. I actually live right in the middle of this area now, um, and it's all city. And uh, what happened was people who were developing the main core of the city, which was around the river, uh, had strenuously argued that they couldn't have those indigenous people, well, they use not so kind terms, so near the city. And therefore there was a bunch of very uh, suspicious types of things that happened and we were dispossessed. And we still don't have federal recognition because of that history. But part of the reserve area had this area of Black Mud Creek, which is a tributary of the North Saskatchewan River, which is the core river. And along that, there had been talk of a burial ground. And there's some other indicators from uh, firsthand accounts of white crosses, as well as some little hints on various maps about, you know, Indian gardens, which are often a euphemism for, for burial grounds and other things. So we worked with the community to conduct a ground penetrating radar and ma magnetic radiometry survey of an area where they were concerned that there may be burials. And this area was identified in part because there was threat of development. Uh, it's behind a Baptist college in the south part of the city. And there was a developer who, who purchased this area and was planning to build. And the community was like, we need to look uh, to make sure, you know, we're not gonna be disturbing burials because we think this is a high likely area of where these might have been. So we did with the archeological field school at the university, um, look through uh, the various documents, uh, aerial photos, try to reconstruct the landscape. And then we did conduct a uh, ground penetrating radar and magnetic radiometry survey over a number of different areas. Initially, the developers refused to give us access to the main area of concern, which was the big empty open field. Although we eventually made the argument that you're gonna have to do this anyway because the province won't give you clearance to dig until you do, uh, and we'll do it for free. And that seemed to work. And so they had us uh, come in and we did do some survey of the area. Uh, the area in the field itself was surprisingly empty and even, which suggests a history of development. Uh, so there's definitely something going on there that has been, the land has been significantly modified. But while we were waiting for access, we did a number of areas nearby. And what's really interesting is that one of those areas was an area that the elder who had come out to do ceremony for us had specifically pointed to and said, I think they're over there. And that is the spot where they were. So this uh, purple square, is where we actually had results. We had 15 reflections total, three of which looked like they're very likely to be unmarked grave based on a trait space analysis. And one of them showed up on both methods. So we had a ground penetrating radar signal, and we also had a strong magnetic radiometry uh, signal, which might mean a metal object in a burial. These were probably historic era. Uh, and all of this sort of aligned with, with what the community had, had said. Unfortunately, it's right near an area that's treed, and so we can't look further into the trees because the ground penetrating radar doesn't work there, uh, but the area is city property. So what we've been then able to do is protect the area, um, acknowledge that it's there. COVID slowed down a few things because we did this work in 2019, um, but the community also would like to put up some sort of monument or, or recognition because people just walk by there with their dogs all the time over the graves of my relatives. And it would be really nice to have that space honored and recognized. And there's many other places that we need to, to likely search uh, as well. And then I'm just gonna end by talking a little bit about the work that has really become the focus of a lot of my time, energy uh, and attention since uh, Tkumloops to Shwetmek had announced in 2021 about results from a ground penetrating radar survey originally uh, discussed as 215 children. In fact, it's 200 anomalies of interest, uh, but in an area that had long been talked about in the community as having, having burials. And that has really led to an explosion of, of work of which I have turned out to be at the center in Canada. And I know it's also starting to happen in the US. Just briefly, residential school system, government sponsored church run, uh, it formally became part of Canadian policy in the late 1800s and operated for over 100 years. First Nations children were forced to attend, uh, and in fact, the police would come if parents didn't send their children. And they were incarcerated in these institutions, often far from home, in substandard conditions, and were mistreated uh, in, in many, many ways. And many died 
thousands died. And we've actually known this for a long time. Survivors have shared it. There was a whole volume of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that we had in Canada, which specifically talked about missing children and unmarked burials, because many of those burial locations are not known. Parents were not notified. If there was a marker, it's no longer there. And in many cases, entire cemeteries are gone that were on school plans because they knew children were going to die. So the search is now underway to use tools of archaeological prospection to help find potential locations where these graves might be. So we're not in the business of proving that there were deaths or proving what survivors know. We know that this happened. We are trying to find these places. So since 2021, there's just been an absolute, you know, again, explosion of work. There were many nations who had this they were really interested in doing this. Some of them had started this work, you know, 15 years ago or more. But with the commitment of government funding and with the kind of outrage that was the response to this, there was a huge demand for ground penetrating radar, searching these landscapes. And some nations sort of rushed into that, perhaps in a way that wasn't the most effective because they were, there weren't enough people to go around to do it who knew how to do it. There's actually still a very small community of us that actually have experienced using archeological prospection techniques such as ground penetrating radar to find number of graves. Uh, and there are some places where that's not an appropriate technique either. And so we've been doing a lot of work to try to support communities in figuring out what the best approach is for their various school landscapes. But in the midst of all this, you have this huge triggering of trauma as well. So archaeologists are at the center of this work in Canada, especially around this ground searching at this stage. There may be forensic work that will happen in the future, but no one's there yet. So archaeologists are really in the center of this conversation because archaeologists have been working with communities. I first did a survey for Amar Graves in 2018. I have colleagues who started this work in 2010 or even earlier. And the way that we use archaeological prospection techniques uh, is the most suitable and applicable to this type of search, unlike what the geophysicists might use or what engineers might use. This is the kind of thing that we might look for as archaeologists anyway. So there's a transference of that skill set. And of course, coming back to what the actual series is about this year, archaeologists have gotten better at working with community. And so many of us have experience doing that. And let me tell you, those big geophysics and engineering companies have no experience in doing that. And therefore, we're turned to as, you know, a trusted source of information, which is a very different role than how archaeologists were 25 years ago. There remain a lot of challenges to this work. Um, there's a lot of rushing that's happening. It's starting to level out, but certainly in the first two summers, it was just full steam ahead for everyone to the point that sometimes that wasn't perhaps uh, done in the best way. We don't have enough people who know how to do this, and we need to build more capacity in community, but there's, again, not enough of us even to train community members to do this work yet. Uh, there are huge issues with communication. There's a lot of poor reporting and misinformation from the media at the beginning. There's also challenges because there are 140 recognized schools across the country, but it's never one nation, one school. Most schools had 20 plus nations whose children were taken. So you need to connect across those communities before work happens in order to ensure that everyone knows that you're looking for missing children. And then there's that coordination piece. The government threw a bunch of money at this at the beginning and not much else, and is now trying to kind of play catch up with figuring out how to support communities in other ways, because money itself is not enough to solve the issue if you don't have people who can actually do the work. Uh, and then communities need to continue to find ways to, to work together. The poor communication at the beginning also led to a lot of misunderstanding of what GPR can do in particular. And I have spent two years telling communities what GPR can and cannot do. And they're finally starting to understand that it won't, it's not an x-ray, it's not going to find graves. We can find shapes that might are grave-like that they can then further investigate. And that's about the best we can do. And then we've seen a big rise of denialism, of trying to undermine the work that we're doing. And that's been a huge issue as well. And I wrote this piece with Sean Carlton uh, at, at the one year anniversary of the, the findings from the Kamloops, because people are really trying to say that it wasn't so bad and there aren't any bodies, et cetera. Okay, to summarize, um, 
when I talk about archaeologies that matter, I'm, you know, I, I was trained that archaeology is just important because humanity needs to know its history. But when I talk about archaeologies that matter, I'm, I mean it in terms of to people other than archaeologists. And what are those issues that, that people care about that archaeology can help to understand? And I see a next generation of students coming to work with me who want to do this kind of work. It's not just an intellectual pursuit for them. They want to make a meaningful difference. They want to contribute uh, to other communities. And this requires uh, you know, ongoing work uh, around policy and practice, changing uh, legislation, changing frameworks. Uh, I mean, we know how much archaeology happens in cultural resource management. And in order to change practice there, you have to change policy and legislation. Uh, how do we integrate Indigenous knowledge in ethical ways? How do we continue to advance the science? One thing that we're seeing in the work around unmarked graves is how do we do this better? How do we improve the methods in order to provide more clarity for communities? Uh, really focusing on you know, the, the values that Indigenous communities hold about their own past, and then working for justice. And because with the missing children in particular, communities have not had any justice for their stolen children who never came home. And many are now asking, how can that happen? And archeology? span has a role to play. So there's a lot we can do. I, I think archaeology is very powerful, but I think we can continue to evolve and continue to move forward into a brighter future for, for everyone. So hi, hi, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Supernant. Uh, that was, before I, before I move forward, I want to invite the, the the attendants to uh, put your questions in the Q&A section. We'll, we'll, we'll get through some questions here before we, we finish tonight at seven. But I just want to say thank you for sharing with us. That was impactful and, and meaningful. And, and I know I took so much away from it. So I just sincerely thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I have a question first um, that came in about um, met, you mentioning that um, there wasn't recognition for the Métis. Um, is there efforts to gain recognition, um, assuming that's that's beneficial? Yeah, I can provide some perspective on this. So we are categorized differently. So First Nations are governed by the Indian Act, uh, and then Inuit, who primarily live in the north, are governed by a, a separate agreement. Uh, Métis are not governed by any agreement because the script process was sort of designed to not need that. Uh, it didn't really work, but it was designed to sort of um, address any question of rights and title. There have been a series of court cases over the past 25-30 years which have challenged how Métis are recognized in, in, the in the provincial and federal government. So for a long time the provinces had sort of jurisdiction over the Métis so they were seen to be like a provincial concern and in 2015, at the Supreme Court of Canada, it was successfully argued that, in fact, it's the federal government who has responsibility to engage with us, duty to consult, uh, all that kind of thing. So there is movement happening in that way. And, for example, the Métis Nation of Alberta, of which I'm a citizen, has recently uh, entered into a more nation-to-nation uh, -nation relationship with the Canadian federal government uh, so that we have more governance. But it's tricky because we also have to be respectful of the fact that the Métis homeland is a whole bunch of First Nations homeland as well. And so it's incumbent upon us to recognize our relations with those places, but also with the people who were there even before many of us were. Uh, so there is work happening in, in those various kinds of ways, uh, but it's still not entirely resolved because we are not First Nations. We are Métis and that means we're governed uh, differently and we have access to fewer resources and, and benefits and, and other things. At the same time, many of us are uh, are positioned differently in terms of contemporary Canadian society because we weren't sort of stuck on reserves and limited in a lot of the things that, that we did. So different histories of dispossession um, with with Métis and First Nations. So hopefully that, that clarifies. Yeah, definitely. No, thank you. Um, I got a question here from, from one of our own staff members, Ashley Thompson, and she, um, is very grateful for your presentation tonight too, and wanted to, to ask about um, what you would tell young indigenous archeologists and students who might be struggling with within this, within anthropology and archeology span um, as a discipline, if, if, if you could possibly give some this advice. This is a really good, good question. Um, and I having had the great honor and privilege to work with a number of indigenous students, especially graduate students, um, I've sort of seen different ways in which indigenous, um, 
students in particular have struggled to navigate through um, anthropology and archaeology because our ancestors are still in museums and still in classrooms and still being treated with uh, a lack of respect. For some people, it's too much uh, because we archaeology is not far enough along in, in terms of creating a truly welcoming space. Uh, at the same time, I think when you find connections with people who understand that legacy and that history and are truly committed to undoing those histories of harm, uh, I even think about the way that Dartmouth talked about those results versus what they would have said even five years ago. I feel like the messaging is shifting to be more like, we were horrified to realize, yes, it shouldn't have taken you so long to realize, but that kind of sense of like, we recognize how harmful this is, is to me very different than the narrative, even 10 or 15 years ago around like, well, but do we have to give them back, right? So I think we're seeing a shift, but it, it's not soon enough for, for some. And I recognize that. Um, I also say that for indigenous students, when they're working more closely with their own community, there can be a lot of power in that or working very closely with community. Because yes, the anthropological space can still sometimes feel very alienating, but then when you're sort of wrapped with, within your community or within a community uh, and you're upheld in like, we really need you to do this, it helps to give you that strength to continue on. And I certainly would say an invitation to any young Indigenous students, reach out to those of us who have come before you because we are committed to creating space for you. I'm very excited that I'm teaching a field school that's starting in May. I have 17 students and nine of them are Indigenous, which is just amazing to me. And so I think there's possibility. So reach out to people who've come before. We, we want to support you and we want to uplift you. And we want to create a space where you don't have to change who you are in order to be an archaeologist. That's powerful. Thank you for, for sharing that with all of us. Um, do you think there are uh, salient differences on either side of the Canadian US border that facilitate or inhibit archaeology with and for Indigenous communities? Hi, John. <laughs> That's a John question. And of course, John has an amazing chapter in Archaeology is at the Heart, so read it. Um, it's I Heart Archaeology. It's fabulous. Um, so yes, there are salient differences. And there's a few things I'll just quickly mention. One of the outcomes of NAGPRA has been TIPOs. And you know, for all of NAGPRA's challenges, the fact that one, there is NAGPRA, and two, that there are tribal historic preservation officers embedded in federally recognized uh, uh, tribes has built capacity. And so that there is someone whose job it is as part of the tribe to do that work. In Canada, we don't have anything like that. There are some nations who have archeologists on staff who have roles like that, but it's by no means even. And it's actually very uneven across the country. There's lots in BC, British Columbia, there's none. I don't know of a single archeologist who works directly for a nation in the province of Alberta where I'm situated. So there's that, that piece. Um, also, there's, I think, differences in practice around uh, CRM that are also uh, different across those borders. Uh, and in Canada, what I've seen is that the, there's a huge difference in legislation across different provinces and territories, because it's all provincially and territorial ma ter territorially managed. So in some places, there's um, incentive to collaborate and in other places there's these outdated pieces of legislation that actually get in the way of collaboration so there are some sort of legal differences between the U.S. and Canada. The one thing I'll say on Canada's favor is because we're based on a British system of government and all lands in Canada technically belong to the crown and the people sort of lease them through a fee simple model of ownership, private land is not a barrier as much. So any legislation actually covers things that happen on private property because the concepts of private property are different. And so that actually opens up opportunities. There's still challenges, but technically a private landowner cannot prohibit someone from doing archeological work or the nations coming in to do that work on those territories. Uh, and I think we're gonna see more um, use of that uh, as we move forward as well. So those are just a few observations because there are definitely differences in the, in the practice. Yeah, definitely. No, I, I, I imagine so. Um, I feel like as we're wrapping up, there's a, a really good question that, that I think will leave everyone kind of happy and satisfied. But um, someone asked, uh, are there anything Canadians and, and or non-Canadians can do to help, um, given the need that you mentioned for more help in this process? 
Yes. I think there are a few things. Uh, one, in the US, for example, you have your federal Indian boarding schools. And while there are some amazing archaeologists who have been working on them, working with nations and their nations who are taking this up, in many ways, the conversation is behind because we had our Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So there's a huge body of like archival documents and literature that's been compiled and understood that we can draw from to do this work. So there is work that needs to happen in the United States to support nations to find their tribes to find their children. Uh, and I think there was a huge rush of attention and, and it's sort of mm, just less in the, the public eye. It needs to stay in the public eye because the only reason that it went so quickly and there was so much invested in it was because there was national and international outrage. So we need to keep the pressure on. We need to keep saying this is needed, right? This is something that that's really uh, important and that we need to uh, continue to focus on uh, and continue to do your own learning, right? Especially if you're not Indigenous and you don't know as much about that history, there's great resources out there to do this learning um, yourself as well. So I encourage everyone to continue to do your own learning. And that doesn't necessarily mean turning to the Indigenous person you know. That means searching out what those things are because there's plenty out there. You don't just need to talk to a colleague who may not be in a position to want to educate you about that at that time. Uh, so that's just some some reflections. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. So I'll invite, um, as, as it's seven, um, and we're, we're finishing up, I'll invite Bill back to kind of close out the night. And thank you so much. And I can share resources. And also, I, we do have a newsletter. So I can send that to Sarah and she can distribute it to everyone. We will, we will be sure to do that when we send out the send out the link for the video. So thank you so much. Great. Just underscoring many of the comments and were not so much questions as just like, wow, excellent presentation. I really, you know, <laughs> the hearts were stimulated by your presentation tonight. So thank, thank you so much. And I think that this series has done a, a great deal. Your comment that, you know, archaeology hasn't come far enough yet for some indigenous um, people to, um, you know, find it as a, a career. But I think that these presentations, all you attendees tonight, uh, you got to see it here live, um, but it will be a living uh, thing on our, our uh, YouTube site. And I think it will help to educate a great number of, of students going forward too. So thank you so much for an excellent presentation. And next month, May 2nd is the final of our of the series. So uh, Wade Campbell will uh, be wrapping up the, the series on collaborating with Diné communities. And uh, I hope uh, we can uh, have an, another uh, great gathering uh, in May. And uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone who, who joined us tonight. And thank you, Kisha, very much. And good job, Sarah, for stepping in here tonight. First time. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.